through Freemasonry, the times have changed quite a bit. And the personalization in Freemasonry has changed as well. This evening, we're going to be talking about a fascinating topic around bringing back and reviving the concept of personalized Freemasonry. We said we were going to talk about this once before. We ended up talking about chickens the whole time, but I can promise you tonight, we're not going to talk about chickens. We got a wonderful guest right back on with us that's going to take us all through this topic. So stick with us right after this on Historical Lights. Welcome back to the Historical Light Masonic Podcast, dedicated to illuminate our past and bring our Masonic history to light since 2016. And now, enjoy the show. Welcome back, everybody, to Historical Light, an independent Masonic show focused on the historical events and aspects within Freemasonry. I'm your host, Brother Alex Powers, and we have with us a great guest with, again, Brother Chad. If you don't mind, Brother, I'm going to pass it to you for more proper introductions. Oh, let's see oh, if we can unmute you. There. there we go. <laughs> Hello again. So my name is Chad Kopensky. I am, uh, let's see, past master of Paramute Theater 25 in Athens, Ohio, and past district deputy and past district education officer of the 17th Masonic District, um, immediate past chairman of the Grand Lodge of Ohio Education Committee, and currently the president of the Midwest Conference on Masonic Education. Um, and uh, we're not talking about chickens tonight. I think we've decided this right off the bat, right? Nothing well, I did have one question about no. Oh, yeah, okay. we'll, we'll, no, okay, no yeah. talk about chickens. Yeah, it's fine. Right <laughs> but it's an honor to be back here. So thank you very much. So I'm glad. We, well, I'm thank glad, you, I'm glad we didn't do this because I think it's a it's going to be a good topic to talk about. It is going to be a good topic, and it's funny because when we came up with the idea about the April's Fool episode, um, I had. I can't remember the the title I came up. It was just a spoof title to get people to click on it, whatever. You came up with this title of reviving the concept of personalized Freemasonry because they thought it would go best with what you talk about and people would mm -hmm. buy it. And it was just like, that sounds like a good topic. We need to talk about that. So <laughs> so here we are. I, I appreciate you coming on and being such a sport. And I can't believe we pulled off an entire hour last time uh, just talking about chickens. But well, we got a lot to talk about. <laughs> I really, you know, I, w I do wonder, like, of course, you know, of your fans, how many of them figured out the joke and how many of them, like, you know, stuck stuck <laughs> in to see, like, okay, where are they going to take this? I really hope that, you know, some of your fans realized eventually it was a joke and, you know, that we were going to see that, you know. That yeah, I, I noticed uh, through it just a little bit, we, we started getting... And what about masonry? And then I think yeah. people started putting it together. We did have one guy watching the show that night uh, that just so happened to be like an industrial chicken farmer, and he was into it, man. I so, know. I kind of want to talk to that it. guy. Like, cause, cause, <laughs> exactly. I have questions. So, but no, that was fun. And I thank you for doing that. It was, it was a blast. No, it was a blast. So, brother, we're, we're going to get into the topic tonight, but before we do, I know some people are familiar with you, may have caught the episode last time. For those that didn't, I want to go through and get to know you just a little bit with some icebreaker sure. questions. Uh, so it's probably going to be a little bit of a duplicate from last time, but those joining us for the first time, I want to uh, give them the chance to get to know you as a, a person, as a brother. So I just want to start off here with what is it that got you into Freemasonry to start with? Um, I... I grew up in uh, Wisconsin, uh, and uh, I met a girl, and uh, I moved down to Ohio. And my transition to Ohio was not a good one, uh, because you build this life for yourself. Like I lived in Milwaukee for almost twenty years. Before that, Madison for almost you know twenty some years. And all of a sudden, I felt disconnected, and I was and I was looking for a way to connect, because I recognized that um, if I was that as miserable as I was, it wasn't going to get any better if I, until I actually took a step. And mm. my parents had always kind of taught me two things, that uh, your duty is to develop your gifts to the best of your ability and use them in the service of others. And that 
if you are looking to love something, the best way to learn to love something is to serve it. And so I realized that if I was going to love Southeast Ohio, Appalachian, Ohio, I better find a way to start serving it. And so I always kind of been curious about fraternal organizations. Um, I collect swords. And so I had a couple of, um, you know, nice Templar swords and odd fellow swords. Sure. I didn't really quite know what they were, but they were cool. Um, and so I actually called the odd fellows first, but they never called me back. And, uh, but I contacted the Masons and the guy who met me just to kind of give me basic information was somebody that I knew from uh, the school that I was teaching at. And we just started talking That's awesome. and um, all of a sudden, all of a sudden I was connected. All of a sudden those connections made sense. All of a sudden I saw right. connections where there weren't before um, in my little town, the, you know, the Masons pretty much settled the town um, established the university that's here. And so when you're walking down the street, you seeing like, oh, this is Carpenter Street? You, know, you mean Brother Carpenter, the dude whose sword is hanging in the secretary's office? And, and it's hard to feel disconnected when there's such an avenue to connect to history, to other people. I mean, right. it just, all these connections are opened up to you, which is wonderful. So, yeah. Couldn't agree more. Well, I'm... As bad as I say saying this, I'm glad the odd fellows didn't call you back right back because we probably wouldn't have got a hold of you and, and had such a great brother we do. So maybe Thank things you. worked nice out the way that. they were supposed to. Uh, Thank you. That's nice you to say that. I kind of hope that, you know, there's an odd fellows lodge that's actually nearby us. And, you know, I'm tempted to join, but we got enough going on. <laughs> I understand that. I've always been curious just because. Uh, here in Kansas, Oddfellows was a lot bigger before Freemasonry really took root. And a lot of our lodges actually started out uh, by renting and leasing space from the Oddfellows because the lodge rooms are so similar. So like my lodge here in Gardner originally started out in the Oddfellows Lodge 23 here in town. So, and with all the similarities, I've, I've always had that interest, but here in Kansas, the Oddfellows are like non-existent these days. Really? We still have a grand lodge and I think like three lodges, but I've tried reaching out, never heard anything back from them. So, yeah. So it's it's endemic. Um, so that's funny. Uh, well, okay. before we get into the main topic this evening, I do want to give a quick shout out, uh, one, to my wife, Yvette, for doing all of our sharing across the social media pages. Appreciate you helping out with the show each and every time. And I want to ask you guys as well, give us a like, give us a share. Uh, if you're not following us currently on Facebook, YouTube, or TikTok, we're live on TikTok as well tonight. Uh, make sure you follow uh, all the channels and help share us out there. I uh, do want to give everybody a chance to join the show here and become a supporter through Patreon and to give our current Patreons a huge shout out and a pat on the back for helping the show uh, continue and grow. We've been around since 2016. We are fully viewer supported and thank you guys so much. So if you want to join the team here at Historical Light, you can do so by going to the website, historicallight.com slash support and join us on Patreon. And you can do that through PayPal as well. I also want to give a shout out here to MasonicCon Kansas that we're hosting, bringing it to Kansas for the first time this year, August 27th. It'll be held in Prairie Village, Kansas. Uh, it's a suburb of Kansas City Metro. So if you guys are interested in that, we do still have a few of the full tickets, including the festive board left. If you're interested, go to the website, MasonicConKansas.com and get your tickets while they still last. Also need to give a shout out to everyone that's joining us live right now and to the Staley family who's been joining in pretty much every episode recently and uh, playing it on their TV in their front uh, in the front room there. So appreciate you guys supporting the show and tuning in every single time. Yay, Staley's. Right? All right, man. So we've got just made, a I'm lot. Just anything to show them. Like, <laughs> yeah, right? Hey, Lisa, I got nothing for you. I got... I got some Lego. I got Rolf. Is that? Is it, sorry, Stanley. That does it. That does it. Well, man, we have got a heck of a show tonight. I know you sent me a four page sheet of notes. That's nice and full. So let's, let's get into it, man. Okay. So what brought you into this topic of reviving the concept of personalizing Freemasonry? Let, like, let's start there and really what, what's that mean for you? What it means is this, um, when 
I'm trying to find the right way to start this. And I think I'll start it this way. Coming from the background that I did, um, I had to sort of make Freemasonry fit me, for lack of a better word. There's a number of, I come from a, <clears throat> a Jesuit university. I come from a theatrical background. I come from having a wide variety of, of interests and having you know, read a number of different things. And so we're all kind of on this quest to figure out how the world works and our place in it. And masonry is a lens for us to do that, to view Definitely. our world and to kind of figure out our place. But I had all these other things too. And so how does that fit? How does that work? How do I make Freemasonry make sense to me? Um, how, if I'm coming in looking for connections, which I was, then it is incumbent upon me to find the connections that I need. Likewise, I feel like it's incumbent upon the lodges to help forge and foster and strengthen uh, in those connections. Grand lodges are wonderful and you know, district leaderships are wonderful. But ultimately, what Freemasonry comes down to is the relationship and the connection between the brother, his lodge, and his community. And so ultimately, Freemasonry is this personal journey, right, towards becoming a better man, father, friend, husband, pick it. Um, you're on this personal journey, but that journey is supported by others who are on the same journey, just at different, different points. Yeah. And so we need to stop thinking about Freemasonry in broad brushes and broad strokes and start thinking about it in terms of those personal connections, those, those making it personal um, for the lodges, for the brethren, for the community. So, and I can expand on that. That's probably the best place to start. I, I fully agree with you. So, you know, one of the things we were talking about uh, in the green room is, is kind of how we've seen some of these changes happen throughout different jurisdictions. Uh, now, in, in Ohio, I know you've you've dug in quite expansively on on your history there and involving this. How have you seen that personalizing factor change over the last few decades there? It actually goes back further than that, and it has to do, oddly enough, with the concept of proficiencies. Believe it or mm, not. Okay. So, um, Ohio requires a proficiency between the degrees. They've had that uh, requirement since 1820, 1830, but they didn't have a standardized ritual really until 1891, which meant okay. that Grand Lodge gave the power to the individual lodges to say, one, what ritual they were using, two, so what ritual looked like in their lodge and what it meant for some, a brother to be deemed proficient in the work, proficient in the lessons and mysteries of that, which meant that a lodge could essentially personalize their experience, personalize um, the needs, requirements, the, the actions of their lodge according to the time, the talent, the treasure, the, the needs of the lodge rather than in their community. Um, what is also interesting is there's been a rush to standardize that. I mean, if you look at all into the development of ritual across jurisdictions, right? There's sort of the quote unquote ritual wars of the late 1800s where we're trying to get some standardized ritual, you know, people right. are, um, and then we get to the point where all of a sudden we have, um, at least in Ohio, we have this call for some standard way that brethren are, the, the, a standard experience that happens, right? You come into lodge a certain way. Lodge meetings are held a certain way. Certain things are done. Um, what is interesting, I think, is that uh, leadership made a lot of assumptions about what was happening in the lodges and then realized when those things weren't happening that they had to kind of provide resources or structure or directives to make sure that those things actually happen. Yeah. Um, and then uh, it gets a what we're seeing now, at least in Ohio and in some other jurisdictions as well, is we're seeing sort of a return back to that giving power back to the lodges, recognizing that broad strokes, that top-down directives, that a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't 
work in a state like Ohio that has 25 districts and 440 lodges and 65,000 masons, or Wisconsin, which has thing like 12 districts and 130 lodges and 10,000. It's like it, it, it can't be right. a one stop shopping thing. But now the issue is empowering those lodges uh, to go through a process to identify what is valuable to them, what is meaningful to them, and then create an experience that reflects those values, what's important to them, what they appreciate, like to, to in essence, own their own masonry. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, no, it does. Uh, it's an interesting concept because when you go to re or relate, you know, the personalized concept of masonry to how proficiency's changed, at first you have a hard time seeing that. Um, but starting to connect those dots, it, it makes sense. I mean, the ritual is kind of the, the cornerstone of what we do and who we are. Uh, so to that essence, it plays and, a huge factor in that. And many jurisdictions, even to this day, um, they allow the lodge to determine when a brother is proficient. Yeah, suitable proficiency, um, right. And I think, um, and believe it or not, at least the 12 jurisdictions that are part of the Midwest Conference that I actually like looked at, um, the uh, only one of them actually requires memorization. The rest is pre preferable or it's not required at all. You know, and mm. so, um, and there's probably some historical and social uh, reasons why for some reason, you know, memorization is pushed super, super, you must memorize this. You must, you know, say it from every open lodge when that wasn't always the case. In fact, for most of Freemasonry, the demand for memorization wasn't there. Um, yeah. But again, uh, yeah, K Kansas kind of takes an official yet an offhand ish approach to that. We, okay. we require memorization. However, we leave that suitable proficiency to the lodge to decide. So, how memorized that happens to be is, you know, up to the lodge to decide if it's good enough or not. And, you know, and I think it's almost, I'll be honest. I appreciate that. And I like that because, um, I mean, ultimately, right. Ultimately the most powerful, most powerful tool in a lodge is the ballot box. Ultimately the sure. most powerful person in a lodge is the individual brother. Right because um, that harmony of the lodge, what constitutes uh, what constitutes a lodge, their, um, their values, their personality, that, that should reside in the lodge. Um, we had, over the course of uh, many things in our history, there were a number of, for lack of a better word, controversial issues that came up. And, you know, whether it's, um, Probably the best way to say is somebody who's perceived as, you know, other at that point in time in society and whether those other people would be allowed to be members of Ohio lodges and time and time again, um, Ohio at least gave that power back to the lodges and said, sure, that's in the ballot box. Like, we're not going to come and tell you that, you know, you can't, we're not going to tell you that a guy with tattoos can't be a Mason. Uh, that depends on your lodge and, you know, your culture. But alcohol, for some reason, there's like 70 years where whether a guy sold alcohol, uh, whether he could be a Mason or not. And that, it, that was just silly. Anyway. Um, so I, Facebook is hating me tonight, just for oh, the good. record. I, I've, I've liked two comments and it's telling me that I'm transacting stuff too frequently. So for those out you, uh, of those of you out there commenting on a Facebook, not ignoring you. Facebook just hates me. So just bear with us. But we do have a comment here from uh, Most Worshipful Past Grandmaster Michael Stoops. Uh, oh. Might be a hard hitting one, but I, I want to read it here and get your perspective. Let's, he says, uh, well <laughs> You know uh, what's coming. I, he says, When 58% of the Master Masons in Ohio in the last 20 years have been brought through via a one day class, how are they truly giving back anything to the lodges? Grand Lodge is making the majority of the Masons in the state sound more uh, cookie cutter than individualized. I would, um, 
I would have to see those numbers. And he probably has seen them differently than uh, than I have. Because um, most of the Wheeland uh, looks at those numbers in a, in a different way. I'm also no longer part of the education committee. And so it's difficult for me to speak for the Grand Lodge of Ohio. And so I will offer this opinion and this thought. Um, oh, this is going to end up being like, it's going to be a long walk. And but I think I can shorten it this time. His question was, basically, it's a quality question. What quality are we bringing, are we bringing there? Yeah. And you know what? He's, he's not wrong. The issue that I have with a one-day class is, um, is this. And um, yeah, I'm not sure I can shorten this, but we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Those same studies about, you know, the drop-off rates, three, five, seven, ten, whatever. Statistically, the numbers that come in, um, regardless of how they come in, whether it's a one-day class or whether they come in traditionally, those numbers statistically at those benchmarks are pretty much the same. Hmm. And so then that means what, what's the magic, what's the secret sauce? What's the magic thing? Um, and what we're finding more and more is a difference between why a guy stays versus why he leaves has to do with the investment that a lodge puts in him. Those per the time they take to make those personal connections with him, those times they take to find out, okay, what, what are those, you know, what's the guy looking to connect with? He's joining for a reason. Yeah. Right. Um, and so if a lodge takes the time to invest in those connections, more and more of the guy's going to stay. But here's the other thing that I think, um, Again, I don't want to. I don't want this to be a referendum on one-day classes because that's you know the it's one of those things that you know they serve a purpose. Sure. The issue comes in 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 for me that I think it makes it in some ways really easy for a lodge to give up their responsibility. I think very often what we get is we get people who make one day class masons feel like second class citizens. I think very often we get mm. people who say that people coming through a one day class, you're not really a mason. And I, yeah, that's, that's unfortunate. And to my way of thinking, I, if I see the grand hailing sign, I'm not going to ask a guy, hold on. <laughs> were, you were you a one day? Or did you, I mean, yeah. but listen, the argument and the debate is a valid one. It really is. But yeah. I, in my mind, and this again goes back to this whole, I had a whole thing about this, is there is a duty and a responsibility in the lodge to uh, to connect with their members, regardless of how they come in. Um, people also leave because those connections haven't been forged or they've been allowed to decay. Um, and so if we can get lodges to stop thinking in terms of guys coming in the door and start thinking about meaningful connections, I think we're going to be able to solve some of those problems or at least look at them in a different way or attack them a different way. Right. Um, and again, like, I mean, all respect to, you know, most of the stoops and I, believe me, I know that he, he's very passionate about this. I'm not the guy to argue. I'm not, I'm not the guy to, to argue with because um, I don't represent Grand. I don't represent, represent Grand Lodge of Ohio. Um, I have a particular viewpoint on it. Um, sure. Well, so. I think I think what it really comes down to, like, like you had mentioned on it, is is that value factor, and right. and also also with you know with the bulk approach, how can you give an individualized experience when we're going through stuff like you know even to take it outside of blue lodge, but Scottish right reunions and, and blue lodge one day classes and such. But one, one thing you mentioned there uh, that I, I do want to point out because I have heard people say that and it, it's not right. And it's not fair. And I know the majority of Masons do not feel that way. And that's, 
that's pointing out the fact of if you went through a one day class, you're not a Mason or you're not a full Mason. Um, and you know, to bring up because, uh, most worshipful stoops kind of got us on this, on this topic here. I've personally heard him say this before too. The beef is not with the Mason himself. It's if you went through a one day class, lodge lodge exactly. Lodge. It's, it's with the process, the approach, because it's about you. And I think what most people feel, especially brother stoops here is that approach uh, can potentially take away from, from your experience. And that, that's what it's all that. about. So yeah, it's, I absolutely agree if you went through but a one day class, the, it's not you, it's, it's the approach that you went through. So yeah. But, the, but there's also this, right? So the idea is that we're robbing that person of an experience. We are. I mean, because it's a different experience. And I have a couple of responses to that. Um, and again, depending on how you want to take this, we can go that way. But I mean, the, <laughs> you know, think about when, think about when Masons say was the golden age of Masonry, right? That post World yeah. War II, pre Vietnam era, when lodges were, you know, bringing in four or 500 people over the course of a year, um, the traditional way. Um, there were a lot of assumptions that that kind of mentoring, that kind of proficiency was being done. And what they found, and this goes back, honestly, back to the 1800s, that um, because a lodge determined what made a guy proficient, there wasn't any real, the lodge determined when a guy was proficient. And some lodges took it very seriously. And some lodges just said, okay, you know, you're proficient. Um, so, I mean, it, that goes back to, I guess, another way of looking at this, which is I recognize that there is value, absolute value. I mean, I went through the quote unquote traditional way and I got a lot out of, you know, the degrees and taking the time I did to learn my proficiency because I also recognize what the proficiencies are supposed to do. Um, and I'm not sure that all brethren understand what proficiencies are also in. There's a specific reason for the proficiencies that I don't think we totally talk about. But I also had a brother once, because I used to be that guy who would sort of say, well, those one day classers, those aren't, you know, real Masons. What changed my thinking was a brother said to me once, why should my experience reflect your values? Why should the way, like if, if I want to be a Mason, but I have these limitations, whether it's memory or time or whatever. Why does my entry into lodge, why does my entry in the craft, why does my experience have to reflect your values? Mm. And I'm like, you know, I'm not sure that I have an answer for that. So it changed my thinking that, um, it, you know, it just changed my thinking on that. So. No, and I, I think you're you're dead on point. You you got some excellent, some excellent comebacks and some points there that you know need to be addressed. So, hundred percent. There's the hard part is there isn't necessarily one right answer. You know, I, one day classes they serve a purpose. They do, but I think it's also far too easy for lodges to um, abrogate their responsibility. So. Right. And that's one thing I know that in Ohio we're trying to hammer home is that uh, your responsibility to that brother is the same regardless of how he comes in. 100%. So we we do have a, a comment here from Brother Clark on, on the Facebook side um, who actually said he originally joined in on TikTok this evening. So thank you for that, brother. Um, but he put on here, let me pull this up and read it, said, so uh, switching over to Facebook, I came halfway through a one day class and I returned all my work and I've been mentor to three candidates. Nobody in my home lodge connect with we, so I had to drive to another lodge to seek that out. Is that a bad thing? No, because here's the deal. And this is this is going back to what I, you know, <sighs> why do guys join Masonry? They're looking to connect, right? How many Facebook friends do you have, Alex? 3,000, 9,000, 120,000? Well, Facebook friends stopped you at five, 5,000. Okay. So Fine. who knows? How many, honest to God, friends 
do you have? How many guys do you, or women do you talk to on a regular basis? On a regular basis, I talk to a group of less than a hundred, less than 10. Right. Um, and, and to specify world. that would be guys that I can truly confide in 100%. Like, yeah, it's a small group. You know right. what I mean? So we live in a world that we are hyper accessible and we are connected at a particular level, but guys are looking to connect deeply with something. It could be history. It could be, mm -hmm. Their communities. It could be deity. It could be like-minded individuals. It could be, um, you know, so, service. It could be something. You know, they're um, they're looking to connect at a different level, um, and so they join us, looking for those connections. They stay because we forged those connections, or and they leave. Because again, those connections have been allowed to wither away. Brother Clark, I'm assuming that is the brother Clark that that I know pretty well. Um, yeah, he said to say Jay that you know him. <laughs> yeah, I just saw him on Monday. Um, the uh, uh, here's a great example. There's a uh, gentleman in my district. Uh, he's since moved away, but at the time he lived literally across the street from a particular lodge. That lodge wasn't giving him what he wanted. And so he actually found a lodge an hour and a half away. And with that lodge religiously. And he said, Chad, yeah. I, I'm for what I'm looking for, it is worth my time to drive an hour and a half to get the connections and the experience that I want that reflects my values, that reflects what I think is important and what I want out of masonry when I wouldn't even cross the street for that lodge and some guys would some guys are looking for what yeah i don't know uh bottle cap lodge i mean bottle cap lodge right there they do really great stuff you know with i don't know they've got great fellowship and they do great things in the community but that's not what that dude wanted he was looking for something else he was looking for right. education and ritual and esoteric and whatever so he was worth it drive and a half to go to I'm just going to keep pulling things off my desk and I'm going to name lodges that, by the way. <laughs> so he went to Yo-Yo Lodge because that gave him what he wanted when he wouldn't cross the street for Bottle Cap Lodge. So, and, so this so, is how we got Cheese Ball Lodge in the notes, right, in, correct? Yeah, <laughs> in the notes that I sent. Absolutely. Because I was eating some cheese balls. Uh, so, so to that point, it, it makes me wonder here because – and you'll have to you know school me on how it was in Ohio there. I, I feel like it was probably of the same. But here in Kansas in – Oh, until the last few decades, probably, probably a little longer ago than that, um, lodges had jurisdictions of their own. So you couldn't just go to any lodge you wanted to. Um, if you lived like a school district, if you lived right. within a radius of this lodge, that is where you went and you didn't have a choice. Um, how was it in Ohio? It was absolutely like that. And I'll like be that. honest, I'm not exactly sure when that ended. I believe, uh, I don't even want to venture a guess. Um, yeah, I don't want to venture a guess, um, but we'll say it has at least been the last 40 or 50 years that that has yeah. been the case. Um, and my only rationale for saying that is one, that's a fairly safe bet. And two, when you look at the early um, the early jurisprudence things and the Grand Lodge um, proceedings, it's all about, well, yo-yo initiated some guy, but he lives much closer to bottle cap. And now we're going to, you know, file charges and yada, yada, yada. So, but yeah, that was absolutely the case that you, you had to join your local lodge. They had sort of that right of first refusal. And if you didn't like that lodge, you were kind of hosed. So, right. Um, it makes me wonder though, you know, when they, they lifted that policy, how that played into that personalization factor of of being able to have that opportunity to seek out a lodge that you may fit into better that responds to you and and your style of masonry better well i also imagine that guys would find a way around it right yeah you yeah. may have had to join cheese ball lodge but if they're not giving what you want if the lodge that the is the next town over those are the guys that you work with those are the guys you know that's you know half the guys in that lodge are either you know your family or you know 
the you know the people you went to high school with. You may be yeah. a member of this lodge, but you're going to go do your work be visiting at that lodge. Visit that yeah, lodge. just spend your time there. Yeah, and that makes one sense. Thing that we, one thing that we have as brethren, I mean, the one commodity we have is we have time, and where we spend our time, that's where we. That's I mean, that's that's our currency. That's how we uh, you know express ourselves, express what our values is by how we spend our time. A hundred percent. So one other thing, while we're still kind of on the the topic here of of proficiency and such, okay. um, Brother Staley had brought up that here in Kansas, which we do um, have the ability for a shortened form of proficiency and a long form of proficiency. And uh, someone had commented, "Could we explain that, please?" And uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, this is okay. Short form in many jurisdictions and with all things, you know, it's jurisdictional. Someday, by the way, someone needs to rewrite that Tom Jones song. It's not unusual to be it's jurisdictional. I think that they, someone could just do that right off the bat. It'd be great. We just play it every time because the answer to so many things is it's jurisdictional in many jurisdictions what qualifies as the quote unquote short form proficiency are things like what would be our modes of recognition right so you know steps scripts words uh oaths and obligations tend to be what many jurisdictions consider their short form in various permutations yada 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 what other what many jurisdictions consider to be their long form is a variation of what used to be called the work lecture um, and still mm. is referred to that in a number of jurisdictions. Um, the quote unquote, like questions and answers that were part of the conferral of a degree. Um, you know, whence came you from the lodge of you know, blah, blah, blah. what came you here to do? And then there's the response. And so there's that um, for many jurisdictions, those quote unquote questions that you would find in the work lecture in, you know, pick it, you know, whatever version of Preston Web or whatever version of Richard that you have, along with a demonstration of steps, grips, words, modes of recognition, um, that usually consists of long form. And traditionally, that long form was done from memory. Very often that was done because of necessity, because so many lodges or so many jurisdictions didn't have an available printed uh, ritual until late 1800s or 1900s, even, yeah. even today. I mean, many of the, many of them are ciphered um, somewhere on this desk. I have one that is, uh, has the symbols as opposed to the, uh, the ciphers, but um, the instruction was done mouth to ear. So brother had to memorize it. They had to give it back, you know, word perfect. Uh, but in lodges that didn't have a standard ritual or just that didn't have a standard ritual, you saw great variations in the ritual, great variations in um, what was said and how it was said. And so every lodge kind of had their own different take on the ritual, their own different take on what constituted, you know, being proficient in their version of the ritual. Um, even today, I think Grand Lodge of Scotland doesn't have a standard ritual. I think even they kind of allow lodges to kind of have their own different variations. Kentucky does. Kentucky doesn't have a standard ritual per se. They've got three that they, they tend to use. So that was a very uh, answer to that person's question, and I digress, so I apologize. I, I think it's safe to blame anything in Kentucky on Brad Drew. We'll just, yes, we'll just leave it for that. Brad Drew, and that, 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 that causes everything. Brown it's Liquor and Brad fault. Drew make everything <laughs> bad in, in, in Kentucky. So, um, but proficiencies. And uh, you know what, let me just say this because I think that that, I think that's, I think that that is, um, uh, I think it's indicative or at least representative of what, you know, I'm talking about here. I think we tend to look at proficiency the wrong way. I think- okay. At some point, I think at some point we lost sight of what proficiencies are supposed to be and what they're supposed to do. Um, Give us some insight on that. What, what, what's I, your perspective there? Give us some insight. What, what's your perspective on what it should be? If you look at what our proficiencies are supposed to be, there's really a threefold 
reason for those things. One, it is that practical demonstration that a brother has, you know, that they have the words and they have the form of our ritual. They, right, they know what the words are, they know what they're supposed to do to be able to confer that degree. It's also supposed to be a springboard for the brother to start asking why. Well, why do we square our corners? Why do we use yeah. those words? Why do we do those? And so it's supposed to be that springboard for further study. But I think the most important thing, and I think the thing that we've tended to lose sight of, is the fact that it, one of the most important parts of our proficiency is that it is a platform and an opportunity for a wizened and proficient brother to sit down with a new brother and teach what it means to be a man and a mason and a member of this community and a member of this lodge. And, you know, because I am assuming you've mentored candidates like I have, right? If you're sitting down for an hour, how much are you really drilling on the words and how much are you starting to talk about my daughter did this, the dogs did this, listen, this is what's going on in my life. And, you know, it's my wife says, you know, it's those bonds and those friendships that are formed. And the proficiency is kind of a means to that end. Yeah. Um, and I think that, and I don't have any evidence to support this other than the reaction of many Grand Lodges, is that at some point, I think they started viewing the proficiencies as a as a burden, especially the memorization part of it as an obstacle, which is why we see right around like the late 90s or 2000s, we see jurisdictions stop doing the quote unquote long form and embracing a short form or going to an alternative proficiency or, um, and I have no evidence to support this, but I think we started viewing proficiencies as an obstacle as instead of an opportunity. And I yeah. think we lose something by that. Well, you know, to, to kind of tie in on that, one thing that I see, um, and this isn't just my lodge, my jurisdiction, I, I've seen it out and about, um, is the fact that we lose that opportunity and in, in, not across the board, but in many cases with that mentoring aspect, uh, what I see happen most often is the mentor is strictly making sure that you've memorized the words on the page and they'll check because. in with you and how are you doing with that? You got that ready? You ready to prove up? Good. And and it's cut and dry and that's what it is. And I have a we learn so much. Too. Where's the mentoring? <laughs> what, what, what's your theory? Um, see, you're going to end up painting me like the conspiracy theorist of Ohio masonry. And first off, again, <laughs> I don't represent Ohio. I just represent my little compound, but, and I don't have a tinfoil hat, but I, I do. I have a chicken hat. Anywhere. Anyway, the about chickens. No, about chickens. Um, <laughs> okay. What is the definition of a good mason? I would venture a guess in many jurisdictions, especially 30, 40 years ago, the definition of a good mason was a good ritualist. I can see that 100%. If you yeah. look also at when we started doing inspect inspections of lodges, it was the ritual because that's pretty mm -hmm. easy to inspect. It's either right or it's wrong, especially once especially once we have a written you know, written standardized ritual. Um, we also have back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, back in that golden age, we have so many brethren coming through that the lodge didn't take the time to mentor them in the three ways that I said, right? The, the, the practical, yeah. the esoteric and the meaningful connections. So we have guys who in their mind, proficiencies are all about one, the practical, not the esoteric and not the meaningful connections. And they sure. can't pass on what they don't, what they didn't receive. That's true. And you know, I, I think that kind of ties in perfectly to a little bit of the chat we were having in the green room about how a lot of our lodges get so stuck in something that was 40 years ago, thinking it's still current, like 
my lodge often talking about how much we help other lodges with degree work when we really haven't done that in years. <laughs> you know, we hold our own, but no, we're not helping all these other lodges. When you ask them about it, it's like, oh, well, yeah, that was probably 10 years ago. It's 10 years ago. The, the, see, where I see that and where it bothers me the most is I'm a big fan of what I would call intentional ritual. Like, um, and I am very lucky. I live in a state that has very pointedly said that where the ritual is silent, the lodge can interpret, right? So in theory, I could translate our ritual into Klingon and I could have a Klingon lodge. <laughs> now, it would require a lot of effort and I don't know that I could actually justify doing a lodge in Klingon, but I mean, in theory, I could do that. And we have some jurisdictions where playing music is absolutely verboten. Their mindset is where the ritual is silent, the lodge, you know, is prohibited. So we're a little lucky in this. But what that means in Ohio, at least, is we have such wide variety of, of things where our ritual is silent. And so what our lodges do is really interesting. But then when you ask them, why do they do that? They have no clue whatsoever. Um, there's a part of our ritual where... Um, we say the words, especially this, right? Um, if anybody know, thinks about the opening and closing of Lodge, right? Harmony being the strength and support of all institutions, especially this. Somehow I see in Lodges that uh, it started off with the hand gesture on especially this, especially this. Somehow that's grown over time to where I have seen guys like drop to the floor and wail like it's the beginning of Lion King when they, you know, say, especially this. You ask them, why are you doing that? What's the point? Why, what is the intention on doing that? Well, that's how we've always done it. Or that's how I was told to do it. Or, I don't know, people like it when I do that. And that bothers me just because... Well, I just had this wonderful opportunity to create a lodge experience that reflects their values, what they find yeah. important. Um, and it doesn't have to be music and smoke machines and, you know, tuxedos and saxophones. It could be just something as simple as a lodge deciding. <laughs> was that, was that your, was that your dog? <laughs> that's Hazel. Hazel has a little like cough. I'm sorry. Did that totally come through? Uh, I got the whole yak and everything. It was oh, I'm great. So sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Sorry, Hazel. <laughs> I, it's I, how we personalize masonry. It's how we personalize masonry is we let the dogs hack up along. And now trouble's walking off because of, uh, sorry. Oh um, good. Let me give you an example. Okay. Is yeah. Um, and I will name this lodge by name because uh, I like a lot of what they do. It's sure. Amesville 278 in Amesville, Ohio. Okay. Uh, when they do an entered apprentice and they put um, the apron on somebody, they, when they tie it on, like for the first time the guy wears his apron, they snap those strings and they tie like, a, like they tie a super tight knot. And they do that because a couple of years ago, they were sitting around as a lodge and they just asked the question, like, what to you is the most important part of, like, what's the moment that you knew you, you know, had joined something special? And guys kind of mentioned, like, what was the most, you know, what, what was the point in their degree that really mattered most to them? And one guy said, you know what it was for me? When they put that apron on me, the guy who put it on me, he tied that sucker tight. And he, yeah. I heard the snap of the strings. I felt it against my back. And as they were saying those, you know, I just already heard the, the, le the apron lecture. As he put it on me, I felt bound. I felt like, mm, I that, like that weight around my waist. Yeah. I felt, yeah, this is, this is part of me. I, and you can, you can take it as like the shackles if you want to go that way, but that's not really what it was. He said, I felt, I felt bound. And it's much like, yeah. oh, that's awesome. Everybody coming in from now, we're all gonna we're all gonna do that. But we're also gonna make sure that afterwards that we tell them why we did that and like the importance of that. Sure. And that to me is that 
that's that opportunity a lodge has to personalize masonry, to yeah. make it a personal experience that reflects, you know, their values, what they find important. I mean, that's, it's, it's one example. Yeah, I, I think that speaks so much to the entire concept and the importance behind that personalization factor. I mean, it, I've said it a hundred times, you know, when I, when I look back at my personal degrees, uh, I, I think they did great, but obviously a lot of what we do is memory work. And some of that can come off as very memorized, just what it is almost, you know, monotone robotic. What stood out for me so much, even to this day, was my stair lecture mm. and it stands out to me because i thought the degree had ended i thought that the guys must have saw this oh crap stare in my face that i just wasn't getting it because the guy doing my stair lecture put his hand on my shoulder kind of pulled me to the side wasn't talking to the lodge he was talking to me and he just has started having this conversation that was the stair lecture that i had no idea and i'm sitting there like Oh, oh, okay. And I'm really paying attention. And it wasn't until the end that I realized, oh, he wasn't just like actually explain like that. That was part of the degree. And it, it hit me. And that has stood out to me so much to this day, the way that he did it. Um, you, you that personalization this. factor was, was huge. You haven't talked about this. Um, I talked about it. Uh, honestly, I'm sorry. I talked about it on another podcast. I cheated with you on another podcast. I'm so sorry. Um, Kicking you off I know, right now. I know. It, but uh, in Amesville, again, we have this John Shearer book of prints um, from 1866, and it's it's beautiful. It's just it's a it it's rare, um, and they they still use this in the in the lectures. When I give a lecture, I I don't use the DVDs. I don't use you know. I put two chairs across from each other, and I put those those um those pages of that book kind of right here and i talk to the guy i look at him right in the eye and from time to time i'll gesture to the plates because when is the last time somebody actually looked at you in your eyes for a significant amount of time when is the last yeah. time when you saw those lectures somebody actually spoke to you our lectures have two real purposes i mean one is prescriptive for the for the new guy sitting there we're telling them listen you are becoming a mason this is who we are so we value this is the this is the important stuff but it also tends to be descriptive for the guys that are on the sidelines it's a way that they can reconnect with their own experience it's reminding them of what their obligations and things are so there's that twofold sort of um responsibility to the lecture but it all starts with you talking to the guy getting the degree for the first time and yeah. talking to him and not talking at him and um, making sure I like that the that way connection you put happens. That. I like the way you worded that talking to him, not talking at him. I, I think that's, that that's huge. It's, it's a subtle, subtle wording, but it, that's huge when you really think about it. How many lectures have you seen where this is going to do nothing for the people who are listening to this in their car, but like, <laughs> they're standing here and they're, you know, the person giving the lecture is right next to them on their shoulder and they're both looking at a projection on the wall or they're both looking at whatever. No eye contact between them. They're just kind of standing shoulder to shoulder. You know, it's, it's impersonal and our degree should be personal and transformative. Yeah. And so if you start thinking about our degrees in terms of it's an opportunity to make a meaningful connection there's all kinds of opportunities that are opened up for you. So. That's beautiful. I love that. You know, it brings to mind, it's kind of a side tangent here, but, you know, conceptualizing what the candidate goes through in the degree versus what the brethren go through in the degree, because often there's an entire reality behind what the candidate, you know, experiences, um, that can really play to two, two different memory factors, you know, there, and without going into too much detail, there's one degree we were doing and those Masons watching will know there's a part where you present the apron, right? And that the apron strings are quite long. So the brother preparing that apron had tied it up in a certain way and used a fancy knot that I was not 
used to or never seen before in my life. And apparently you could just take the string and just, and it would just fall apart and be all good. I'm up there trying to, you know, do my lecture and in the moment, and I'm very OCD. So if you throw me off one little bit, the whole thing just goes out of my head and I go to pull this out and it just tightens. And I'm sitting there trying to figure out this like matrix of a puzzle in front of me on a and knot. Then you have a and your, and your head goes blank. Yep. Mm -hmm. And of course the Tyler that did, it's just sitting there and his eyes are getting all big, like, no, pull it this way. But he couldn't say that. And it just makes me laugh of how often that actually happens of, you know, the brothers have practiced and they see the degree this way, but the guy going through it has this entirely different uh, perspective, but it can be saved by the way you go about it. You know, two comments on that. Um, what people don't realize is, see, now you're going to get me off on a much different topic than I came here tonight <laughs> to talk about. That's all right. Uh, you know, who is our ritual for? Yeah. And I hear a lot of just say all the time, it's for the candidate. Great. Then why is he blindfolded, you know, a ton of times? Um, I had an argument with somebody once about they, there's a, you know, the, a sharp pointy object that they use at one point in one of our degrees they had this really beautiful sword they were going to use and and i said great why are you using that sword well that's for the candidate to make sure he's got a really phenomenal experience like that candidate is not going to know whether you're using a sword or a knitting needle so who's that Very sword true. for well i said and it's okay to admit that it's for the guys in the sidelines it's yeah. okay because the guys in the sidelines have never have we talked about how our proficiencies there's three different things that it serves so do our degrees right they yeah. serve the candidate absolutely it's prescriptive to him to tell him what we're supposed to do for our audience the guys in the sidelines are supposed to come there and be part of that community to commune to reconnect with their oaths their obligations their experience to see yeah. somebody new coming to the community our I said it a thousand times. Our degrees are Christmas dinner, right? You come yeah. home to Christmas dinner and you do these things at these times in these ways because it's Christmas and this is what we do. And the third group is the people who are conferring the degrees. There is a specific role and a specific thing that they are empowered to do because of the role they have in our ritual. And this is something I'll, I'll just talk about some other time because it's the idea of... Um, holy theater of piercing the veil of being able to peel back to peel back that layer and glimpse the infinite the people conferring our degrees have that opportunity and there's a way to get there but a lot of that starts with the officers of your lodge sitting down and having that conversation of this is who we are as a lodge this is what we value this is the kind of experience we want to offer to our candidates coming in the door, our guys sitting on the sidelines, and us as officers. Yeah. The experience we offer reflects our values, reflects what we find important. So let's work together to craft that experience for those three constituencies that reflect our values and our uh, our uh, what we find important. A hundred percent. So we got to nothing on those four pages that I gave you. Didn't everything. <laughs> That's all right, though. It, it's been a great chat, honestly. And I, I think, you know, just letting it go often yields some of the best conversation. Well, yeah. We are um, coming up on nine o'clock here. But before we hit that, uh, I want to hit on two points um, mm -hmm. before they leave my head. Sure. Uh, one brother Stoops left another uh, comment just right along with what we're saying there, saying, uh, Why do we all clap when the lecture is finished? That's an excellent yeah. point. It ties right in there. The other thing, what you're saying, um, I think it fires in all cylinders for that communal aspect. Obviously the degree itself is a rite of passage for that initiate, for that brother. But at the same time, if that's the only light you view it in when you're doing the degree, that's how it's going to come off. It's going to come off as mundane as a task. Yes. If like, like you're saying that brother chose that sword, that wasn't for the candidate that was blind. He didn't, like you said, he didn't know if that was a knitting needle, a pencil, what so have you. He did it for it was him. for that brother. 
you know, exactly. Yeah, he did, him and the audience. And here's and, the thing. Why? If, if I could, if your listeners take nothing else from what I said, because I say a lot. When you sit on the sidelines, that's an opportunity, right? Meaningful connections. That's why guys join. That's why guys stay. Um, I love hearing the stories of the night that you were raised or the night that you were initiated. Who was there? Yeah. Who were the personalities? The guys who are joining your lodge are looking to join a community, which means they want to know the in jokes. They want to know those same stories. So I would love it if you took that new guy who just got initiated and saying, this is what you saw. Let me tell you what happened the night that I was initiated. Yeah. That guy, that old guy who's sitting there in the corner who looks crabby, he was the master that night. And here's what he wore. Here's <laughs> right. what happened. And, you know, the guy who was back in the prep room with me was C. Keith Bateman. And he kept that thing like at 10 degrees because he thought it was funny. And, but you have an opportunity to connect. And not just with the new guy, the guys on the sidelines. I want you to think about the oldest past master you have in your lodge right now. How connected does he feel? Because when he was 20, 30, 40, 50, all those guys that he knew when he was in Lodge, all those guys that he has stories about and in jokes about and other things like that, he's probably pretty sick of having to explain who C. Keith Bateman is. So why yeah. should he bother coming back? Because it's just too tiring. He doesn't know the jokes. He doesn't have those connections. Why should I come back? But if he has the opportunity to connect with those new guys coming in and say, let me tell you about C. Keith Bateman. Let me tell you what happened the night that I was there. Let's yes. keep those stories alive and those brethren alive. Let's keep those connections alive because the guys coming in, that's the good stuff they want. The guys who are there, they don't want to let those connections die. And it's those connections that define a lodge. It's those connections that keep a lodge going and make the lodge unique in quality. So a hundred percent. Well, brother, I want to let this conversation come to a natural end. So we'll, we'll continue here, but we are at the nine o'clock hour. So right on. if you would be so kind, we'll see if you'll offer us a toast this evening. Let me offer a toast here, sweet Lord. I haven't, I haven't off the before. top of your dome. Let's go. Just no chickens. That's all. That's all I ask. <laughs> I want to offer a toast to brother Andy stone, hmm. brother Andy stone, was uh, he was a senior deacon the night that I was initiated. And I knew that I was in the right place and I'd made the right choice to join when he whispered in my ear, follow your guide and fear no danger. He let me know that I was in the right place because he let me know that I was connected and that somebody had my back. So I'd like to offer a toast to Brother Andy Stone and all the brothers out there who have each other's backs. To them. To them. Cheers. That's fantastic, brother. You know, uh, Brother Justin Staley's uh, commenting here uh, kind of struck a chord with him. He goes, it makes me want to connect with Doc a bit more. And for context... Doc is our 93, 94 year old guy at Lodge. He's the know it all. He's got his unlimited card. He's he's amazing. <laughs> he, he just is. Um, but yeah, I, I, I fully agree. And some of the most memorable and cherishing times that I have um, is sitting down after a meeting with Doc. And just having one of those conversations, not, not anything script, just seeing where it goes. And then hearing those stories about the old guys and how he interacted and his path and all this. And yeah, having, having that connection is that personalization factor, you know, without that it's just a group of guys showing up for an hour, reading the water bill and going, that's, that's not personal. That's. I want to offer some comments. And then I yeah. swear to God, I'll stop talking. Um, actually that won't happen. You know that. Um, I tell people that I learned more about being a man sitting at the table and watching my dad and grandfather play cribbage than I probably learned anywhere else. Just listening to them talk and tell stories. Um, secondly, and this is, um, we had a big death in uh, Ohio Masonry recently, a guy named Chad yeah. Simpson. And yes. um, uh, we connected 
honestly because of we have the same name and everywhere I would go, people would ask me, are you that channel? Like, no, I'm the other one. Uh, and, but those connections like that, that he and I had, um, uh, masonry is supposed to transcend things like time, distance, and death. People have asked me why I haven't really cried about Chad. It's because in, in a weird sort of way, I still feel connected to him. I can still hear his voice. It's also only been about two weeks. Um, and when I talk to brethren and they tell me the stories and they tell me their own experiences and we start swapping those stories, it doesn't feel to me like Chad's gone or, it, right. you know, it doesn't feel like, I don't feel, I feel the loss of being able to call him and give him grief, but yeah. I don't feel the loss of that connection yet. Does that make sense? That, that makes total sense. Makes total sense. You know, my, my father-in-law was the entire reason I joined masonry. He was my mentor through the degrees. Uh, screw it. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, his ashes are actually in the wall behind the junior deacons chair because that was his last chair in lodge. Uh, that's currently where I'm sitting this year. And uh, that that's my connection with him. And yeah, I feel him every time I'm there. So it's been years at this point, but I think in a lot of ways, still not real to me either. And I'm, I'm still able to connect with them on that level. So it, it it's different, right? Like, it is. I mean, it's like going back to your old high school. Like it's the, it, you're looking for proof that you were there because those connections so affected you that obviously like you, the connections you had there must have had some kind of physical effect on things around you. Yeah. Um, you know, you kind of go looking to see like, where you carved your initials in or, you know, or something happened. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, we can go a whole other hour on, on other things, but the, <laughs> uh, but that's the good stuff of masonry. It really is. Like it's those stories. Um, I was, I was lucky enough to be asked to speak at, at Chad's Masonic service. And that's pretty much all I did was just tell some stories, um, right. you know, of, how we met and how we connected and our collaboration and how important he was to uh, my family. And um, one of the most amazing things to me, and I'm still trying to process this. So at his funeral, there's probably close to 350 Masons uh, in attendance. Wow. Um, I'd never been to a funeral like that, that, that big. Right. And when it came to the end of prayer, and we all said, you know, so mote it be. The voices there, like, Can only they're imagine. all in that same harmonic range. That 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 it made the room shake. You could feel that the vibrations. You'd feel the power of that voice uh, right. through through your feet. So, all these voices in unison, calling out, affecting the world around it. And your voice is part of it. Yeah. Like, again, it's not a process. Yeah. And those connections transcend things like time, distance, and death. And that's how we need to start looking at masonry. Yeah. Numbers are great. And numbers are numbers are, are we need to sustain us. But we need to start. But numbers alone masonry. don't bring you that. Numbers pay the bills. Numbers alone don't bring you what you experience. That's where that personal connection that's right. comes in. That that's, that's right. that speaks to the importance of this entire episode is is moments like that. Because of those personal connections, that brother brought those brothers together, and and that was able to be experienced. And that I don't know, man. It brings up so many thoughts, but it's. It's almost like we were talking about the degree factor earlier and, and the importance of it being not just for the candidate or the brother himself, but for everyone. And I, I think when it is for everyone, it's carried out differently. But in my mind, I can almost conceptualize it in the manner of like breaking bread with one another, which I know we do that at Table Lodge and Festive Boards. But symbolically, like going through the degree is, is like, breaking bread masonically with one another. You know, it's like, that's exactly right. Communion, right? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. I said this in another podcast too, when I was cheating on you. Um, I'll never trust you again. There's a Polish tradition called the Oplotic 
and it's a, it's basically a communion wafer, and it's done at Christmas. And the idea is, is you break bread, and it's it's and you pass it around, and you say like happy things, but you do this thing at this time with these people to mark this time as sacred, and because you do it, yes, it it is a reminder that there are certain connections that transcend time, distance, and death. And so when you do that, you remember the people who can't be at that table because of whatever reason. Like yeah. and then at the end of Christmas, I take the aplotic from the table and I go up to the cemetery and I put it on my dad's grave. And over COVID, when I couldn't go to my parents' house for uh, Christmas, my mom, when she came to visit, brought the COVID from the table, or brought the, the COVID, brought the, <laughs> brought the uh, aplotic from the table to me down here, and I cried my eyes out because, again, it was a it was a reminder that certain connections transcend things like time, distance, and death. And yeah. when we come together, when we commune together, it's that reminder. And why I say that our degrees are like Christmas dinner. Imagine if you imagine the first time you went to your wife or husband's, uh, you know, house for Christmas. Somebody to tell you what the rules were. Somebody to tell you what we do at Christmas. They had to prescribe to you what the rules are of this family's Christmas. And then later on, when you were part of the family, you could then describe what the rules are to, you know. Cousin Marcy, when she brought her boyfriend, our rituals are Christmas dinner. And if we start thinking about them in terms of connections, it opens up a world of possibilities. So that's beautiful. I swear I'm going to, I'm done talking now. I swear, Alex. You're good. I, you know, I, I think this has been a wonderful conversation. We have touched on some epic points and I've immensely enjoyed every bit of this chat with you tonight. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity for any, uh, any closing thoughts on personalizing. I think I just spent two minutes on my closing thought. So I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will yield my time. Um, but I will ask you this. Um, yes. I'll let you get the final thought, which is, um, which is this. what are what are the connections in masonry given you a whole new identity you know i i, I came into masonry young i wish i came in younger but i think i came in at the right time any younger i don't think it would have would have clicked there's always that want but everything happens for a reason um, but within that, there's not, and God, this makes me sound pathetic, but there's not much outside of masonry that exists from my life before, right? Like I've, and I, I think a lot of that's for purpose for, you know, for reason that masonry has showed me the course that I wanted, that I desired, that I needed. And it has honestly given me more than I could ever put into words. And I think that is why I'm such a go-getter and I'm always, always doing something Masonic just because as much as I'm always searching for that experience or whatever, at the same time, I'm always looking for a way to give back to even a small smidge of what masonry's done for me, what it's opened my eyes to, what it's altered the course of, you know, my life of who I am and, you know, changed me for the better. Um, but obviously still much more improving to go, but to sum here, it up, here. everything, everything. Here, here. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally agree. Thank you for this opportunity. I, I enjoyed doing the chicken episode, but I also, I can talk, <laughs> I really enjoyed this. So, I mean, it was an honor to be here. It was a, uh, uh, thank you for letting me speak and talk about this. This was no. incredibly fun. So thank you. Thank you, my brother. You're a, uh, you're one of a kind. We're definitely going to have you on again. Uh, it's been an immensely enjoyable conversation. Um, I will leave everyone with this. Sit with that and meditate on reviving the concept of personalized Freemasonry. Think about what that means for you. 
for your lodge. Think about how that applies or hasn't applied in your experience and how you could improve upon that. Um, Because I really think that is going to be the driving force that dictates where masonry goes from here. And that is all up to you individually. So think about it and push it. We can save masonry together, brothers. With that, I want to thank you, my brother, so much for joining me once again. Uh, Really, really great conversation this evening. I want to thank all of you for joining live on the multiple platforms. And until next time, we'll see you here in two weeks. Stay careful. Love you guys. Keep seeking light. See you, brothers.